As I read the Bible, there are so many people who come to mind that I'd like to ask about their personal testimonies. Of course, it's a wonderful thing to read the accounts of what others heard and saw and were told concerning how God changed lives. But there's absolutely nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. No one but God and the individual know the most intimate and intricate details of a person's journey. No one but God and the individual know the pain or the anguish that they've endured. It's been said that what's from the heart touches the heart. So if someone were to ask you, who is Jesus Christ to you? How would you respond? If someone were to ask you the question, what has your God done for you? How would you respond? If you were to ask someone like Lazarus to tell you who Jesus Christ is to him, I imagine that he would say something like, Jesus Christ is the giver of life. He can speak life into a dead situation. He can speak life and resurrect a dead body. Or how about if we asked the unnamed woman in the Bible who was known because of her issue? I imagine that She would begin her testimony by saying, He healed me. One day I touched the hem of his garment and he healed me. Jesus Christ is my healer. He made me whole. Someone like the Apostle Paul would in all likelihood talk about how great the love of Christ is. So great that even a man who was once so filled with hate for Christians, a man who used to hunt and persecute Christians, that man could be forgiven, could be loved, and given the opportunity to turn his life around. I'm sure Ruth would testify about how wonderful God's favor is. I'm sure Brother Job would speak of God's amazing power and his ability to restore. He'd say that God can restore all that the enemy has stolen. He can restore even when all hope is lost. And so once again, I want to ask you the question, who is Jesus Christ to you? How would you respond? Saints, on a personal level, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He's my protector. He's protected me from attacks that I never even saw coming. He has been so gracious to protect me from people who were determined to see my downfall. And so what's your testimony? What has the Lord done for you? A lot of times, to do this, we need to look back. We need to take a look back to where we came from and compare it to where we are now. We need to look back and see where God has really brought us from. That's where the true testimony lies. When Jesus delivered and set a demon-possessed man free, Here's what the Bible says in Luke 8, verses 38 and 39. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Now, why did Jesus encourage the man to go and tell of all the great things God had done for him? Well, it's because his testimony would encourage others. His testimony would uplift others. And so, people of God, you should give your testimony. Give it at every opportunity. Not so that you can boast, but so that you can glorify Jesus Christ. Your testimony, it will help someone else's faith. Your testimony will encourage someone who's going through their own challenges. Your testimony, it will strengthen someone's belief that God can and God will come through for them. And above all, saints, the main thing that your testimony should do is it should bring glory to Jesus Christ. God sees the heart. He knows your heart. 
So, in all that you do, ask yourself, am I seeking to be seen, or am I truly seeking the Lord? So now, as we prepare to approach the throne of God, let us have our focus set on being humble and having a pure heart, having a clean heart that does not do things to be seen, but to honor God and give him glory, to be closer to him, to have an intimate relationship with him. We must remember that at all times, we truly have an audience of one. Lord Jesus, Master, we ask for your help. Help us to have clean hearts. Help us to have pure hearts. Help us to seek your mercy instead of seeking after personal glory. Lord Jesus, help us to seek after your approval instead of the approval of others. I pray that you would give us hearts that desire to only be seen and heard by you, Lord. Remove from within us a selfish and prideful heart that wants to be seen and heard by others. Ephesians 2 Verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord Jesus, I pray in agreement with everyone who's listening that you are our master and our savior. You are the Alpha and Omega, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord Jesus, we say that you are great and mighty. You are our deliverer, our redeemer, and the soon coming King. Lord Jesus, we praise you for being the good shepherd, we praise you for being a bridge over troubled waters. You are a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, I thank you right now for all that you've done. I thank you, Lord Jesus, because I'm not where I used to be. I thank you, Lord, because by your grace, I'm no longer living in sin, but I have the strength to fight for righteousness. I thank you for bringing me out of the darkness and into the light. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. It's your grace and mercy that gave me sight when I was blind. Lord Jesus, give me the boldness to declare my testimony to everyone who'll listen. Give me the courage and the boldness to declare all that you've done for me to everyone who'll listen. May you receive all of the glory from my life. My achievements, they're because of you. My talents, all I have is because of you. And so, Father, I praise your name because you're holy and you're righteous. There aren't enough words to express my thanks, my gratitude for all you've done for me. 2 Timothy 1 verses 8 and 9 say, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I will not be ashamed to testify about your goodness, Lord Jesus. I will not be ashamed to speak of all the great things you have done in my life. Not only did you deliver me from the clutches of death, not only did you save me from eternal damnation, but Lord Jesus, you have called me to live a consecrated life, a life set apart from the world. And so I will forever testify of your saving grace. Your word in Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, 
for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I declare that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will declare all that the Lord has done for me for the rest of my days. Lord Jesus, I praise you. Be glorified. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. For the person who is tempted, for the person who is struggling between doing the right thing and the wrong thing, you are battling sinful desires. I want to give you a message which I pray will encourage you to continue fighting to do good. Continue fighting to do what's right before the Lord. I want to talk to you about Noah. We all know this story about the great flood that wiped out the earth. We all know about the ark. We all know about the animals being paired up, and it really makes a great bedtime story for the kids. But on a more serious matter, the story of Noah brings to light some clues, some warnings about the last days. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 to 37 reads, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus, when speaking about his return, said, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So, how do we interpret what Jesus is saying here? How do we make it relevant in this day and age that we live in? Well, Noah was a righteous man. He was a righteous man living in a time when the world was filled with sin. Society had become perverse and wicked. People preferred to do things their own way, and evil was rampant in the hearts of many. Let me stop there and ask a few questions about this current day and age that we live in. Are we living in a time where the world is filled with sin? Has society become perverse and wicked? Do people prefer to do things their own way? And is there evil in this world today? As I continue, I want you to apply what the days of Noah were like and compare them to today. Now, before the flood and while Noah was building the ark, he spent years and years and years preaching to the people and no one responded. People ignored the warnings that God's judgment is coming. People ignored the calls to repent. Now let me ask you, how many people can access the gospel today but choose not to? How many people hear the gospel today but choose to ignore it? I am sure that when Noah preached and after some time when people didn't see the flood coming, I believe he would have been mocked by some and persecuted even. And in this day and age, as we speak about the end times, as we speak about this being the 11th hour and how close we are to the return of Christ, the Bible states in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. We're told that for those of us who wait on the return of Christ, we will have to face people who will scoff and mock us. Now for more detail about what the days of Noah were like, we have to read Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 to 8, which says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, 
and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals, and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. From this we can understand that the earth was a long way away from looking like the Garden of Eden. The Bible gives us a picture that it was more like hell on earth because wickedness had taken over. There were no godly morals, no godly standards being upheld. All the norms had been replaced by evil. All the laws of God had been put aside and replaced by the lawlessness of man. It was a world in which all that was once taboo was now practiced openly. All the institutions of God had collapsed and all of society was coming unraveled. Now, in this day and age, I'll ask you once again, if you look around, look all throughout society, look at the mainstream media, look at some of the actions we're witnessing all around the world, look at some of the laws that are being passed. Are godly morals being upheld? Are godly standards being upheld? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. In this day, Noah had to build an ark in order to be saved, but today, God has provided us an ark of safety, and His name is Jesus Christ. God has provided us with a way to be saved from eternal damnation. His name is Jesus Christ. The question that you and I are to answer today is, are you ready and willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who will save us from the coming judgment of God on this world. And so, I encourage you to be always in right standing with God because the Bible tells us that when Christ comes, it will be sudden and unexpected. Two people will be working in the field. The one that has accepted Christ as his or her savior will be taken. The other one will be left behind. Two people will be grinding at the mill. The one who has accepted Christ will be taken and the other left behind. In Luke 17, verse 27, the Bible says, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. The people of Noah's time were living lives of ignorant bliss, without any concern or fear that their sins would bring down on them the judgment of God. And so, if you can hear me right now, you still have time to get ready. You still have time to make sure your life is in order. So get ready, be ready, and stay ready. Live for Jesus Christ. Do not be caught up by all this world has to offer. Live for Jesus Christ. Repent and live right before God. Now let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, 
purify our lives. Help us to live lives that are strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would change our affections so that they would only be for you. May you be our heart's only desire. May you be the one we seek fervently. May your word be the only thing we hunger and thirst for. Help us to cling to what is good and help us to hate what is evil in your sight. Dear Lord, help us to live our lives with the mind of Christ. May we live lives with an eternal perspective, knowing that one day we will stand before your throne, Master. Thank you. Amen. Now I would like to give you a few scriptures to meditate on. First Chronicles 16, verse 11. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Psalm chapter 9, verse 9 to 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 27, verse 6 to 11. And now, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. My parents grew up in the 1930s and 40s in the American South. That was during a time when cars weren't nearly as commonplace as they are now. Back then, there was a whole lot of walking going on. My parents said that when people came to visit them in those days, they'd sometimes walk their visitors back home just a part of the way. They said that their visit would be so good that they wouldn't want to separate, so they'd continue it as they journeyed along the road. I've heard older preachers relate that sort of love and appreciation of the visitor with a story from the Bible concerning a man named Enoch. One thing that we're told about this man is that he walked with God. The preachers would say that one day as Enoch and God were walking together and visiting, God told Enoch, we're closer to my house than yours, so come on and go home with me. Now, we know that it's so much more than the literal meaning of the term walking with God, but the context those old preachers provided and the thought of such a possibility definitely render a beautiful picture. Genesis 5, verses 22 through 24 says, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Twice in this short passage, we're told the words, Enoch walked with God. When you expand your reading, 
and really try to understand what the Bible means by Enoch walked with God. You'll find that other translations elaborate and say Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God, or Enoch walked with God in reverent fear and obedience. The life of Enoch is summed up by four words. He walked with God. Mind you, two cannot walk together unless they agree. I could even go so far as saying, two cannot walk together unless one leads and one submits. Think of it like this. You'll never have two CEOs for a single company or two captains for a single team or two presidents for a single country. Only one can lead. And this is the same in our relationship with the Lord. Only he can lead. And we are to submit and follow his ways, follow his commands and follow his word. If we try to lead, then we fall into rebellion. We'll fall into sin and into disagreement with the Lord. So I want you to understand what the Bible really means when it tells us that Enoch walked with God. It means he followed God. It means he was led by God. It means he submitted to God. Brothers and sisters, can the same be said about you? Are you walking in habitual fellowship with God? Are you walking in reverent fear and obedience to God? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 verse 6, So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways, and by fearing him. For the believer in today's world, we need to realize that we live in a world that is spiritually dark. This is why the Bible tells us to keep the commandments of the Lord. We need to walk in God's ways because this world, it will lead you to destruction. In this world, godly morals are out the window. Sin is normalized. It's accepted and actually openly paraded for all to see. Pleasure and selfish gain are the primary spirits that determine a lot of people's actions. So, as we live in such a world, how can you and I walk with the Lord? How can we walk with Him in habitual fellowship? How can we walk with Him in obedience? Well, I believe that two cannot walk together if they are going in two different directions. So, in order for us to truly walk with the Lord, we need to turn our backs on the world and all the things it has to offer, and instead, choose Jesus Christ. We need to reject what is accepted and loved by the world, and instead, choose Jesus. Saints, turn away from the world, and turn to Jesus. Turn away from sin, and turn to the Word of God. Make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, and walk in obedience to the Lord's commands, and to His ways. I want to encourage you today. Keep walking with the Lord. Keep walking with Jesus. In this day and age where people are walking in ways that appear to be right in their own eyes, I want to encourage you to keep walking in obedience to God's Word. The Bible in 1 John 1 verses 6 through 7 says, If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. As children of God, we certainly do not walk in darkness. We are not led by the lust of this world. As children of God, we walk in the light because Jesus Christ is the light. We walk in truth because Jesus Christ is truth. We walk in love because Jesus Christ is love. So, dear listener, keep walking with God. In this day and age where people are chasing higher incomes but have lower morals, I encourage you to keep walking with God. Keep walking in righteousness. In this age where people voice their opinions more than they demonstrate the love of Christ, I encourage you to keep walking, keep walking with God. Though you may have to hold your tongue at times, though you may have to endure people slandering your name, I still encourage you to keep walking, 
Keep walking in the love of Christ. Dear Christian, in this day and age where people no longer honor their word, I encourage you to honor God. Honor God both in private and in public. In this day and age where Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and we can see the love of many growing cold, and we can see men become lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. In this day and age, I encourage you to walk with God. I encourage you to seek the Lord intensely. Pray for an obsessive appetite for the presence of God. And so, as you go through this life, make sure that you're walking with God. Make sure that you're walking with the eyes of faith. Make sure that you're walking in the Spirit. In Matthew chapter 19, we're told of a rich young man who comes to Jesus and asks the question, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? I keep all your commandments. I've never killed. I'm not a thief. I love my neighbor. So what else do I need to do? And the answer that Jesus gave this young man demonstrates my point that you cannot walk with God and still love the world. You need to turn your back on this world. Turn your back on what it has to offer. Jesus responded to the young man in Matthew 19, verses 21 and 22. And he said, If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Verse 22, however, then goes on to say, But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The rich young man was willing to do everything apart from turning his back on the world. He was willing to follow every commandment as long as he could still have one foot in the world. But listen, we cannot do that. Christ demands, that we come to him with a willingness to leave all that is in this world. He demands that we be all in for him. Anything less than total commitment to the Lord is not acceptable. Anything less than your full devotion to him will not be acceptable. So, as you go about your daily life, put God first. Turn your back on the world. Turn your back on sin and walk in habitual fellowship with Jesus Christ. Let your walk be one that is in obedience to the Lord. So as we prepare to go to God in prayer, I encourage you to take a moment, search yourself, find out what there is that lures you away in this day and age. In this day and age, what is it that tugs on your heart more than the presence of God, more than the Word of God, more than the will of God. In what areas are you challenged? In what areas do you need to submit to God all the more? As we approach Him, give that thing to God. Now, let us pray. Dear Lord, have mercy on me, Father, and give me the grace to see this world for what it really is. This world would only lead me to destruction, but your way, Lord Jesus, it will lead me to an eternity in your presence. Heavenly Father, open our eyes so that we can see that there is nothing to be gained from this world. This world can only disappoint us, but you, Lord Jesus, you will never fail us, nor will you let us down. Lord Jesus, Joy, peace, protection, and true contentment can only be found in you, not in this world. This world is filled with fleeting pleasures, and I pray that I would never be drawn to what this world offers. Help me to reject the advances of the world, Lord. I desire to walk with you. Your word in Romans 13, verses 12 through 15, it says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I pray that the fear of God would rule my life. Holy Spirit, help me to conduct myself in accordance to God's word. Help me to walk honorably and with integrity as a child of God. Father, help me to walk in obedience to your word. Help me to walk under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let faith be my eyes. Lord, I desire to walk with you always. I desire to walk in agreement with you. I desire to walk in submission to you. Hear my cry, Lord Jesus, as my heart yearns for your presence. Lord, I seek to draw closer to you each and every day. May you be my only focus. May your presence be my heart's desire. Purge me, O God, and remove all worldly desires from my life. Remove any and all ungodly passions. Your word in Luke 10 verse 27 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. With all that I have, with every breath in me, I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. My heart is yours. My soul is yours. My mind is yours. I will praise you with all of my strength. I will worship you with all that is within me. I will bless your holy name forever and ever. Be with me, Father God. Be with me, Lord Jesus. Be with me, Holy Spirit. I thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Verse 22, however, then goes on to say, But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As odd as it may seem, I need you to hear this. Troubles can be a blessing for believers. And what I mean by this is that the Lord can sometimes use our troubles to remind us that He is a deliverer. Yes, God can allow you to face a storm just so that you will draw closer to Him, so that you will come to know Him as your hope and your rescue. Consider this. If Joseph wasn't rejected by his brothers, if he wasn't sold as a slave, would he have known that God would lift him up to become one of the most powerful men in Egypt? If the woman with the issue of blood hadn't suffered for so long, would she have known that God is a healer? If a man named Bartimaeus wasn't blind, would he have known that God can give sight? You see, 
All of these people had troubles. But that trouble was a blessing because it was their issue that allowed them to experience God's power. And I don't know about you, but if an issue will bring me closer to God, if an issue will make me know him in a brand new way, then I welcome the issue because all the more I welcome knowing God. And the thing is, (laughs) the truth is that with some of us, it takes trouble. It takes a tough situation to finally get us on our knees to pray. Some of us actually need a trial. We need to be put in a tough place in order to desperately seek the Lord. Sure, it hurts when those troubles come. But when we keep an eternal perspective, we can say like Paul, that the troubles I face, no matter how difficult or how overbearing they may seem at the time, they are in fact light because they are only for a short while and because they lead to the glories of heaven. You see, God is faithful to empower you to stand strong and victorious. He's faithful that you don't have to live defeated. And so I have one simple message today. And that is because Jesus was victorious over Satan, you too can walk in victory. You can have faith to stand against Satan's attack and win. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to be oppressed. So then, how do we live a victorious life? How can we battle against the raging current and still realize the peace and victory that God wants us to have? Well, as Christians, we have to come to a point of realization that there is a battle going on for our soul. But God has already provided the path to our ultimate victory. It has come through His grace and His mercy. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. And one of the main principles that we need to understand is that in order to receive the victory from God, we need to understand that He's already won. He has already defeated every enemy, every devil, every challenge, every demon. God has already won. The battle has already been fought. He has already won. If we could only understand that, then we'll experience true power and real victory in our lives. Saints, we can overcome through Jesus. And yes, it may be a tough battle at times, but we know that the Lord told us to take up our cross and follow him. As we do this, that's how we'll walk out this victory. It doesn't mean that we'll never be persecuted. Oh, I assure you we will, but we will overcome. It doesn't mean that we'll never experience setbacks. Indeed we will, but in Jesus, we will overcome. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. These are the rewards of walking with Jesus Christ. Victory is a reward. Eternal life is a reward. Everlasting peace is a reward. So get up and fight with the knowledge that there's no one more powerful than our God. No one is mightier than our God. There is none like him. There is no equal to him. There is no one who is on the same level as him. He is all powerful and in him, in Jesus, we have power and authority to overcome anything in our lives. So saints, surrender the battle to him. Acknowledge that victory is his. We are overcomers and we too are victorious. Now let's take a moment and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come right now, God, thanking you for the victory. God, we thank you that no matter what it is that we encounter, no matter what we face in a day, you have already given us the victory. Lord, help us not to see setbacks as defeat. Help us not to see stumbling blocks as the end. 
But Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, to keep our minds fixed on you, to remember that no matter what it looks like, if your word says we're victorious, and if we walk in the ways of the word, then no matter what it looks like, we have the victory. Sometimes we might have to change our minds about what victory looks like. If we look at the cross, just looking at the cross with our natural eyes, Father, we understand that that didn't look like a win. But oh, when we understand what took place in the spirit realm, when we understand that that cross was just a means to an end, then we understand what victory looks like. And so right now, Father, as I pray for our brothers and sisters, I pray that no matter what the cross they're bearing looks like today, that they'll remember that the weight of the cross does not outweigh the weight of the victory. I pray that my brothers and sisters would hold on, that they would stay strong, that they would remain rooted and grounded in you and remember that at the end, when the battle is over and the dust clears, they'll be standing in the winner's circle. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Father, I pray that I would be steadfast and immovable in my faith. Whatever happens in this life, May it not sway me from my faith in Jesus Christ. Should the miracle that I pray for come to pass or not, may my faith still remain in you, Lord Jesus. Should I be perplexed by any situation that I encounter, you are my rock and my faith will remain in you. Father, when life appears to be falling apart, when it's my season to be tested, I pray that the Holy Spirit would help me to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. Help me, Holy Ghost, so that I can realize that the troubles of this life are only temporary. They're only momentary in comparison to the joy that awaits me in eternity. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me. Help me and strengthen my character. Help me not to be someone who's only strong in faith when all is well. But may I be strong in faith always, regardless of the difficulties I'm facing. Your word in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, it says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Father, open my eyes so that I can examine myself. Help me to examine my life against your word. Help me to examine my thoughts and my conduct against what your word says a believer should be. Help me to be full of integrity, to be prayerful, and to be full of love. Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. I bless your holy name, and it's in the name of Jesus that I pray and I give you thanks. Amen. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Examine yourselves 
to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. As I read the Bible, there are so many people who come to mind that I'd like to ask about their personal testimonies. Of course, it's a wonderful thing to read the accounts of what others heard and saw and were told concerning how God changed lives. But there's absolutely nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. No one but God and the individual know the most intimate and intricate details of a person's journey. No one but God and the individual know the pain or the anguish that they've endured. It's been said that what's from the heart touches the heart. So if someone were to ask you, who is Jesus Christ to you? How would you respond? If someone were to ask you the question, what has your God done for you? How would you respond? If you were to ask someone like Lazarus to tell you who Jesus Christ is to him, I imagine that he would say something like, Jesus Christ is the giver of life. He can speak life into a dead situation. He can speak life and resurrect a dead body. Or how about if we asked, the unnamed woman in the Bible who was known because of her issue. I imagine that she would begin her testimony by saying, He healed me. One day I touched the hem of his garment and he healed me. Jesus Christ is my healer. He made me whole. Someone like the Apostle Paul would in all likelihood talk about how great the love of Christ is. So great that even a man who was once so filled with hate for Christians, a man who used to hunt and persecute Christians, that man could be forgiven, could be loved, and given the opportunity to turn his life around. I'm sure Ruth would testify about how wonderful God's favor is. I'm sure Brother Job would speak of God's amazing power and his ability to restore. He'd say that God can restore all that the enemy has stolen. He can restore even when all hope is lost. And so once again, I want to ask you the question, who is Jesus Christ to you? How would you respond? Saints, on a personal level, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He's my protector. He's protected me from attacks that I never even saw coming. He has been so gracious to protect me from people who were determined to see my downfall. And so what's your testimony? What has the Lord done for you? A lot of times, to do this, we need to look back. We need to take a look back to where we came from and compare it to where we are now. We need to look back and see where God has really brought us from. That's where the true testimony lies. When Jesus delivered and set a demon-possessed man free, here's what the Bible says in Luke 8, verses 38 and 39. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city, what great things Jesus had done for him. Now, why did Jesus encourage the man to go and tell of all the great things God had done for him? Well, it's because his testimony would encourage others. His testimony would uplift others. And so, people of God, you should give your testimony. Give it at every opportunity. Not so that you can boast, but so that you can glorify Jesus Christ. Your testimony 
it will help someone else's faith. Your testimony will encourage someone who's going through their own challenges. Your testimony. It will strengthen someone's belief that God can and God will come through for them. And above all, saints, the main thing that your testimony should do is it should bring glory to Jesus Christ. God sees the heart. He knows your heart. So, in all that you do, ask yourself, am I seeking to be seen or am I truly seeking the Lord? So now, as we prepare to approach the throne of God, let us have our focus set on being humble and having a pure heart, having a clean heart that does not do things to be seen, but to honor God and give Him glory, to be closer to Him, to have an intimate relationship with Him. We must remember that at all times, we truly have an audience of one. Lord Jesus, Master, we ask for your help. Help us to have clean hearts. Help us to have pure hearts. Help us to seek your mercy instead of seeking after personal glory. Lord Jesus, help us to seek after your approval instead of the approval of others. I pray that you would give us hearts that desire to only be seen and heard by you, Lord. Remove from within us a selfish and prideful heart that wants to be seen and heard by others. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord Jesus, I pray in agreement with everyone who's listening that you are our Master and our Savior. You are the Alpha and Omega, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord Jesus, we say that you are great and mighty. You are our deliverer, our redeemer, and the soon coming king. Lord Jesus, we praise you for being the good shepherd. We praise you for being a bridge over troubled waters. You are a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, I thank you right now for all that you've done. I thank you, Lord Jesus because I'm not where I used to be. I thank you, Lord, because by your grace, I'm no longer living in sin, but I have the strength to fight for righteousness. I thank you for bringing me out of the darkness and into the light. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. It's your grace and mercy that gave me sight when I was blind. Lord Jesus, give me the boldness to declare my testimony to everyone who'll listen. Give me the courage and the boldness to declare all that you've done for me to everyone who'll listen. May you receive all of the glory from my life. My achievements, they're because of you. My talents, all I have is because of you. And so, Father, I praise your name because you're holy and you're righteous. There aren't enough words to express my thanks, my gratitude for all you've done for me. 2 Timothy 1 verses 8 and 9 say, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I will not be ashamed to testify about your goodness, Lord Jesus. I will not be ashamed to speak of all the great things you have done in my life. 
Not only did you deliver me from the clutches of death, not only did you save me from eternal damnation, but Lord Jesus, you have called me to live a consecrated life, a life set apart from the world. And so I will forever testify of your saving grace. Your word in Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I declare that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will declare all that the Lord has done for me for the rest of my days. Lord Jesus, I praise you. Be glorified. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. 